in victorian days women's place was in the house but not the house of commons or the house of lords 60 years ago women didn't have a vote queen victoria herself spoke up sharply about what she called the mad wicked folly of women's rights but beneath the serenity of turn of the century england social and political changes were taking place more and more schools and colleges for women were opening up in England, United States, and Canada. Some of these had high academic standards. But by and large, the young ladies were herded into boarding schools to learn to be polished, refined, cultured, and skilled in the arts. It was not considered ladylike to be too inquisitive about the world or its problems. Indeed, as late as 1912, the president of Harvard said that women were physically too fragile to stand the pace of university. After finishing school, the well-to-do were sent on the grand tour of Europe, where, properly gloved and parasol, they might gaze at the art treasures of the past and feed the pigeons in a Venetian square as became ladies in a gracious, elegant world. young woman returned, poised and confident, probably a good conversationalist, but more important, a good listener. Her sports might include the gentle game of croquet, but was more likely limited to a stroll in the park. Strenuous athletics, like rouge and lipstick and politics, were considered unladylike. The social graces prepared her for her ultimate role of wife and mother in a comfortable home, well staffed with servants. But if she didn't get married, and wished to or had to earn her own living, she had only the narrowest opportunities if she was to remain respectable. She could go on the stage if she had the talent of a Sarah Bernhardt or a Jenny Lind. She could be a nurse in the romantic tradition of Florence Nightingale. She could be a telephone operator for new inventions or opening up a few new jobs for women. She could be a stenographer if she could learn typing in shorthand. She could be a school teacher, for working with children was considered natural for women. And of course, she could be a governess for the children of the wealthy. These were all respectable jobs for nice young ladies. But at the other end of the economic scale, for women who could not afford the luxury of 19th century respectability, work was no novelty. The Industrial Revolution, which was to bring about the emancipation of modern woman, at first provided her mainly more hard work, long hours, and poor pay. This was the lot of the factory girl, and there were hundreds of thousands of these girls receiving one-third or one-half the wages paid to men for similar work. And work was not confined to the factory. Among the working classes without servants, the housewife's existence was one of almost unalleviated drudgery. There were no labor-saving devices. Families were large and wash day was sweat day. Heating water in a copper boiler, bending over washboards, wringing out clothes, and pushing a five pound hand iron as much as two miles before the family wash was finished. In the homes of the wealthy, these harsh realities existed only below stairs. Above stairs, the tea party and the fashionable at home were the social rights of the age. Help was cheap, so the lady could spend most of her life in boudoir or parlor, indulging those Victorian fancies which had been the basis of her finishing school education. Why should she worry about political rights? As Dr. Samuel Johnson had said, nature has given women so much power 
that the law has very wisely given them little. And yet it was from within this very group, with their servants and their stately homes, that the revolt of the women had its beginnings. Starting in 1792 with Mary Wollstonecraft's A Vindication of the Rights of Women, and later in John Stuart Mill's The Subjection of Women, the intellectual basis for their demands had been outlined. The revolt in England began slowly and quietly, with pickets and pamphlets. People who owned property, they said, should have the vote regardless of sex. Eminent women like Crystal Macmillan spoke up before the British House of Lords. Bills to enfranchise women went before the House as early as 1867, but without success. In 1897, scattered groups of non-militant suffragists united in the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies. But six more years of speech-making and petitions brought them very little closer to their objectives. By 1903, a group around Mrs. Emmeline Pankhurst and her daughters felt that more energetic action was needed to gain their ends. They broke away from the National Union to form the Women's Social and Political Union. These militant and dedicated women, led by Christabel Pankhurst, Flora Drummond, and Mrs. Pankhurst, were out to make history. They held meetings in public squares, drawing rooms, halls, schools, and chapels at street corners and on village greens. These were missionary meetings, and they brought in thousands of new converts. Processions miles long marched through London streets. They chalked their slogans on pavements, paraded in sandwich boards, sold their newspapers in the corner, picketed the House of Commons, and flooded the streets with leaflets and handbills. Having advocated militancy, they could not hold back, but few people realized at the time to what lengths the suffragettes would go. When the Asquith government again refused the vote in 1912, England got a shock. They burned houses, poured acid into mailboxes, broke windows with hammers, threw a hatchet at the prime minister, and stormed Buckingham Palace. The reaction of the authorities was instant and vigorous, yet it served only to excite public attention. The ladies courted arrest and were obligingly carried off to jail. In one period of five days, 124 were arrested. The Pankhursts went to prison many times. In court, they refused to pay fines, preferring jail terms. I want to be tried for sedition, Mrs. Pankhurst cried, and these trips to police court and prison dominated her life. We were no longer a family, her daughter Sylvia wrote. The movement was overshadowing all personal affections. The authorities intensified efforts to subdue the unruly suffragettes and the women struck back with a new and terrible weapon, the hunger strike. When officials tried to feed them forcibly, they resisted. So women were released before they starved to death, then popped back into prison again when they regained their health. This cat and mouse act, as it was called, brought more protests. Outside prisons, like Holloway, well-bred young ladies now marched proudly bearing the symbols of their jail terms. In six years, Mrs. Pankhurst and her followers succeeded in bringing the cause of British suffragettes to the attention of the world. Across the Atlantic, the movement in the United States had started in 1848, when Elizabeth Cady Stanton had drawn up a Declaration of Rights for Women. Susan B. Anthony and Mrs. Stanton led the fight for women's suffrage for the next 50 years. <laughs> 
By 1905, Mrs. Carrie Chapman Catt and Dr. Anna Howard Shaw had taken up the national struggle. Almost as many men as women supported the cause. There was no violence, and the only arrests came from charges of obstructing. But public opinion was divided, and the fight of the suffragettes hit the front pages regularly. In Canada's prairie provinces, a strong movement for women's rights was led by such women as Mrs. A. V. Thomas, an outstanding feminist, and Nellie McClung, a well-known novelist and a gifted speaker. They managed to push the issue of votes right into the center of the political arena. And while the issue confused and embarrassed politicians, the general public settled back to enjoy the fracas. Movies may have made light of the suffragette movement, but they were made by men. The women were in deadly earnest. In England, the fight went on with ever-increasing intensity. The suffragette, published by Christabel Pankhurst from exile in France, had long since become must-reading for young ladies. And now the stage was being set for inevitable tragedy. June 4th, 1913, the running of the Derby. militant suffragette threw herself under the hooves of the king's horse and was killed. And the movement had a martyr. Mrs. Pankhurst's carriage was in the procession, but it was empty. She herself had been arrested under the Cat and Mouse Act, just as she stepped into it. With these incidents and with others like them, bombings and vandalism and arson, all by women, the suffragette movement reached a fever pitch. Yet the suffragettes by their own militants had driven the government to a point where it could not give in gracefully. How can you give in to lawbreakers? The situation had reached a deadlock. And then, unexpectedly, the deadlock was broken. The outbreak of war changed everything. Suddenly, the suffragettes abandoned their demands for the franchise, and women who had once harangued men for the vote now harangued them to join His Majesty's forces. Mrs. Pankhurst's followers, who'd once paraded in the cause of suffrage, now paraded in the cause of the victory loan. Mrs. Fawcett of the National Union urged, let us prove ourselves worthy of citizenship, whether our claim be recognized or not. Militants and non-militants agreed and went to join the Land Army or the Red Cross or other branches of the women's services. Jets still in jail were pardoned, and Mrs. Pankhurst and her followers toured the country making recruiting speeches. The women were as militant as ever, but the militancy was channeled into the war effort. 
First World War took many young women from the sheltered comfort of their homes and private schools and put them in frontline hospitals and overseas camps in face of real dangers. Many went down in hospital ships. Others were killed in air raids. The nurses who died in the bombing of Etaples were buried under crosses marked killed in action. Perhaps the first time in history such an inscription appeared on a woman's grave. The war put England's economic and industrial system under severe strain. While production of food and material had to be increased and increased quickly, Germany's submarine fleets had choked off many lines of supply. Men were needed in growing numbers for armed service. By 1918, more than four million men were under arms. This wholesale withdrawal of men could have crippled the country, but it didn't because women stepped into the jobs they left. On farms and factories and the services and at every hand, these women exploded the old myths of weakness, frailty, and irresponsibility. And they proved that they had the strength, the courage, and the discipline to do men's work. They were exhilarated by their indispensable role in the struggle. A new sense of freedom and equality fired them with new power. politicians were astonished and impressed by all this. And from the Pacific coast to the North Sea, things began to happen on the now quiescent front of women's rights. By 1915, Finland, Norway, Iceland, and Denmark had joined New Zealand and Australia in extending the franchise to women. In the autumn of 1916 in Britain, reform of the franchise laws was begun. By now there was no doubt about women's right to the ballot. Prime Minister Asquith, previously its most powerful opponent, now supported it. And while the government was working out the terms, the women forged ahead in their new busy world. They mastered more and more industrial techniques and even learned the mysteries of the new flying machines. In 1917, the United States entered the war, and the women of America followed the example of women in England and Canada and marched off to war. Within 15 days after the declaration of war, the government appointed a committee to coordinate the women's war activities. At the head of the committee were the two most outstanding American suffragettes, Mrs. Carrie Chapman Catt and Dr. Anna Howard Shaw. Many went into the services themselves. Many more replaced men on the home front. When the Navy ran short of clerks, the secretary, Josephus Daniels, cried out, is there any law that says a yeoman must be a man? Then enroll women. And he enrolled 11,000. Sir Robert Borden, Prime Minister of Canada, said in 1917, women have shown themselves worthy to take part in the government of this country. They have thereby made abundantly clear their right to a voice in the government of the country in which they live. On September 20th, 1917, 
the Canadian government gave the franchise to women directly involved in the war effort. And within a year, the law was extended to include all women over 21. In January 1918, the British House of Commons gave the vote to women over the age of 30. To Mrs. Pankhurst, it was victory, though universal suffrage was still 10 years away. In the United States, the struggle continued after the war, but it was really only a matter of time. With war ended in Europe, the American suffragettes resumed their own private war with the White House. But the opposition was crumbling before this determined feminine onslaught. There were some final demonstrations, a few arrests, but the politicians were climbing on the suffrage bandwagon. Victory came in 1920. Women got the vote on an equal footing with men and there was jubilation among the suffragettes. With the vote in hand, women plunged into the upcoming political campaigns. In the American presidential election of 1920, women turned up at the polls by the millions. By now, women in 18 countries had the vote, and they began to enter the parliaments of the world. In 1919, Lady Astor became the first woman member of the British House of Commons. Two years later in Canada, Agnes MacPhail was elected member of parliament, a post she held for 19 consecutive years. Now women began to make their voices heard in international as well as domestic spheres. At the Treaty of Versailles, when the League of Nations was being organized, a delegation of women appealed for recognition. And their agitations ultimately resulted in the establishment of a special committee to study the status of women throughout the world. One of the first results of the Russian Revolution was universal suffrage. In the new Soviet Union, women were immediately given the vote and equal opportunity to hold public office. The Russian woman became one of the symbols of the Soviet world. Elsewhere around the globe, the battle for rights continued, unrelenting and often embittered. In France, the House of Deputies several times passed bills to enfranchise women, only to meet defeat in the Senate. Then, more demonstrations and posters and pamphlets aimed at women as much as men, for frequently women themselves presented a solid wall of apathy to this new idea. and stubborn as this struggle often was, the pattern had now been set. Equal rights for women was inevitable, although in many cases, it would still take years to achieve. <laughs> 